It's so good to see you guys this morning. We are going to have a great Sunday. It's already been fantastic. Obviously, I am not Pastor Ivy. Uh, Pastor Ivy and Pastor Benet are uh, with their dear friends, Mylon and Christy Lefebvre, uh, getting some time away to just refuel and recharge. And that is really good for you guys because the truth is when a pastor gets away and gets refueled and recharged and hears God, they come back and they give that much more to pour out on you guys. So get ready. It's going to be a fantastic, excuse me, fantastic Christmas season. It already has been and I'm excited for what's ahead. So let's get into this morning's message and uh, we're in this series called A Christmas Carol. And obviously, if you go to church around anywhere near Christmas time in the month of December, you're going to hear a Christmas message. And I want to encourage you not to shut off and say, well, I've heard just about every take, every angle, every Christmas scripture there is to hear. No, no, let's engage our hearts and get ready for what God wants to say to us. Because there's something cool that happens every time that we get together, like God speaks. And that is amazing. But we have to do our part. That means opening up our hearts, creating space in our minds, and letting God speak to us. So let's do that this morning. I love what uh, Peter says. The Apostle Peter says, I came to stir up your pure minds today. So I'm believing that's what God is going to do, is he's going to stir us up in the best of ways today. So we're in this series, and last week we talked about Christmas past And we learned about the origin of Christmas and like where we came from. Like we knew it came from Bethlehem, but like what's the rest of the story? Like where did mistletoe come from? And and all these different characteristics and things that we have that make up Christmas. And it was a shocker because there were some things that we found out like, where did that come from? Like I thought that was something that was in the Bible, and it's not. It's part of like some pagan tradition or something. And, and I, I swear somebody threw out their Christmas tree. Just kidding. Uh, uh, but we found out the origin and the, uh, the Christmas past, if you will. And so today we're going to talk about Christmas present, which is going to be an awesome play on words because I'm just kind of a punny guy. And so we're going to talk about Christmas presents because everybody loves Christmas presents. But we're going to talk about Christmas in the present, like what does Christmas look like in 2017? What, it does, what is the current state of Christmas like today? And, and so let's talk about how uh, the struggle is real, right? Hashtag the struggle is real. So Christmas 2017, I, uh, Good Morning America gave me this statistic, but they said that the average person now spends $967 per person on Christmas. First of all, sign me up for that family because I am joining. And, and second of all, I've never been so excited to be under average in my entire life. And then there's the keeping up with the Joneses, which like keeping up with the Joneses was not hard when I was a kid because I lived on Pearson Lane and everybody was within the same family. You know, we we're all a bunch of Pearsons. Uh, but now that we have social media... You know, uh, we, we crop and we filter, and if, it, if, a, if a picture really doesn't look very good, we just put it in black and white. Anybody ever done that before? And uh, so it's really hard now to keep up with the Joneses because it's the hashtag perfect Christmas, and, and they cropped it so you don't ca- catch the kids fighting in the background, you know, because that's what's really going on, or, you know, the dog's making a mess, and, and uh, that, that's what we miss. But, but we have this pressure because of social media, because we can look into everybody's lives, and we can spend a lot of time filtering and buy special apps to make our pictures look really good. And so we, we have this thing going on. Now, if you're the Joneses in the room, uh, no disrespect. I, this could be the Smiths. This, this could be any last name. But that's what we do. We have this pressure that comes with trying to perform, which I'm so glad God never asked us to perform. He did everything that we could ever need. And now we just believe in him and trust in him. So uh, then there's this statistic that uh, we came across that the average person, the average American during Christmas time will attend five Christmas gatherings. Five Christmas gatherings. Well, think about it. If there was like a divorce in the family, you're going to have mom and dad and then mom and dad again and, and add one holiday uh, Christmas party uh, for the staff, staff Christmas party, and now you're up to five, right? So, you know, that's not unheard of. 
But what they said is on average, you're going to eat about 4,000 calories per Christmas party. And some of you mathematicians have already figured out that's 20,000 calories. No wonder the gym is full January 1 because we ate 20,000, like a month of calories just happened in five Christmas get-togethers. And so then we have Black Friday, or now it's referred to as Black and Blue Friday, because if you've ever tried to go to Walmart in a big city on Black Friday, it, it, it can get a little crazy. Am I right? And now we don't want the, anybody who works retail, we're like, no, 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 don't enjoy a Thanksgiving dinner with your family. Come in early and set up the store so we can get in shopping earlier. So this is the, the current state of Christmas in 2017. This is what it looks like. And the problem with this is we can get into debt. I know none of you guys have ever gotten into any Christmas debt before and said, I'll swipe it now and I'll figure out how to pay for it later. Nobody in here has ever done that. Or, or we go all Carbzilla and we're like, mm, carbs, sugar, chocolate, Santa. And, and we, just, we just go crazy with the carbs and, and put some extra weight on or, you know, and, and all that can lead to stress because we overcommit, we say yes to everything and therefore we underdeliver. And when, once we have stress, the next thing that comes is strife. And it becomes a crazy cycle. Now, I know all of you are good Christians and you would never fall into that trap that all other Americans fall into. Not in Decatur, Alabama of all places. Hence the sarcasm. So then you've got people, the byproduct of that is it goes to another level where you have loss, you have loneliness, you have rejection, you have broken relationships, you have shame. And there's this temptation to what? Medicate. I think all of us can attest to Christmas can be a lonely time. There can be some struggle, right? And so how do we deal with that? Many people turn to medication. In fact, I came across a statistic that said some will turn to alcohol to ease the stress and the average number of fatalities involving alcohol-impaired drivers will raise one-third, 34%, during the Christmas to New Year period. Why? Because in 2017, Christmas present, there's a lot of stress. There's a lot of pressure. But here's the good news. God never intended it to be that way. And we can embrace God's plan and God's gift and God's promises during Christmas. And we can have the best Christmas ever, whether we had better gifts last year or this year, irregardless. But things can get skeptical. People can get cynical. And that can translate even into Christmas. In fact, I want to show you in real time what that can look like, even with the next generation. So let's go ahead and pay attention to the screens for just a moment. So I hope that meet Santa at the mall. You mean Santa, the dude mom mentions to mom looking at me? Yeah, peeps, we know the deal. This ain't my first rodeo. He knows when I'm sleeping. He knows when I'm awake. First off, this guy has no life. And, um, that's really creepy. Better not show, better not cry. This guy's standards way too high. Oh, and who do I trust to buy me the latest toys? An old man living in the North Pole. Right. Let's point out the obvious guys. He breaks into your house at night. I think it'd be safer if your parents just do the stockings. Speaking of stockings, can you just run Christmas like, like it's a birthday party? What's even the deal with Santa Claus? Santa, if you're watching, no offense. So stinking cute. Let's just be honest. That is so stinking cute. But all joking aside, this is what Christmas present looks like. This is what Christmas 2017 looks like. So how do we change this reality? Because somewhere or another in the things that I listed, all of us can say, guilty as charged. Yeah, that one, that one hit home. Yes, I can relate to that. Like, how do we change this reality? Uh, what adjustments do we need to make so we can embrace this incredible season so it can be everything that it's supposed to mean, so that it can become everything that God desires it to be 
in our lives. So here's what we need to do. We, we, we have to latch into this mentality right here, this mindset right here, that Christmas revolves around this indisputable fact that it's based on the giving of gifts. Now, I know you always tell your kids, kids, it's not about the gifts. I'm here to tell you today, it's about the gifts. It is about the gifts. You know why? Because Jesus was the first ever Christmas gift. John 3, 16, God so loved the world that he gave. God's a giver. And he gave us the first ever Christmas gift. So we need to take this mentality and embrace it. That God is a giver. That giving is in his nature. And that he gave us Jesus and then embrace the gift that was given to us. In fact, there's a scripture that as I was studying for this message, I came across, and have you ever read a scripture before and you're like, hey, I've read the whole Bible. I know I've read this before, but I've never seen it before. That's what revelation is. It goes from just being something that you read to now it's revelation. God's revealing it to you. And here's the scripture, 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 15 Paul is at the end of a chapter where he's talking about giving. He's talking about generosity. But he's he's summing it all up and putting it into this short scripture right here, 2 Corinthians 9, 15. Thanks be to God. Thank you, God, for his indescribable gift. Really interesting, because when you break down like the original language that it was written in and you look at these words, That word indescribable right there, it's the only time that this word is actually used in the Bible. Why do I bring that up? Anytime a word is only used in the Bible one time, you need to pay attention. Because literally God, through the Holy Spirit, was speaking to the writer in such a way that they either had to invent or find a very specific word to communicate what God was trying to say to his people. So that the the fact that this word indescribable is only in scripture one time gives emphasis. It'd be like trying to bold, trying to highlight, trying, you know, to, you ever get a text and it's like birthday and it's like confetti stuff going all over the place. That's what should be coming off the pages of your Bible with this word. It's an indescribable gift. And it literally means something words fail to describe. Have you ever been talking to your kids and something happens and you say, there are no words? (laughs) There are no words. Now, that can be really good (laughs) and it can be really not. (laughs) But there are no words. When we're talking about the gift of Jesus, there are no words. It is so amazing, so phenomenal, so fantastic that our, our language cannot do justice to the gift that God gave us. That's how good the gift of Jesus is. Why don't we cash in an amen right there because that's a good place to use one. So Jesus is the first ever Christmas gift. So Christmas really should revolve around giving. The problem is, is many times it revolves around getting. That can happen sometimes, right? where it starts off in a good place and then goes another direction. So how many of us practice generosity during Christmas time? And I'm not just talking about, you know, reaching in, pulling out the spare change to the bell ringers. That's good. That's good. It's going towards a good cause. But I'm talking about really, like, demonstrating and walking out and showing others what this gift of generosity that Jesus brought to the world truly looks like. Reminds me of a story. We had some uh, friends uh, years and years ago, and they are a precious, precious family. And uh, please don't take this, this phrase the wrong way. I'm using it in context to paint a picture but they were a very blue collar family. And, I, and there's no uh, negative towards that. That's just who they were. He was, a, he was a prison guard and because they had three kids at home, they made the choice that she was gonna stay home and, and raise the kids. And so because of that, they didn't have a lot of excess funds. 
And so it was coming up on Christmas and they had some friends who the husband had just left the wife and two kids because of an affair that he was in. Really tragic situation. So these friends of ours had a family meeting. Ever have a family meeting before? Ever call anybody in? Like, and you sit down and you're like, oh snap, what's getting ready to happen here? And they all sit down around the table and they said, you know the situation. So and so, mom and dad aren't together anymore. And they didn't, they didn't force their kids, but they said, we had this idea, would you be willing to give up your Christmas and your Christmas gifts so that this other family and these other kids could have Christmas? They didn't force their kids, but every one of their three kids, and one of them was like a kindergartner. Could you imagine no Christmas for a kindergartner? But they all gave their Christmas away. Isn't that what we're supposed to do anyways, is give Christ away, the greatest gift there's ever been, and we give him away? Guys, that's what generosity looks like. And I saw that kind of generosity happen again this last week. So um, some of you may know, some of you might not know, but at the Athens campus, we're really working hard, just like Decatur. One of the reasons Epic Church grew and has grown the way that it has grown is because outreach and generosity are part of our core values. And that's just always been in the hearts of pastors Ivy and Benet. And so we've been looking for Athens. What is gonna be one of those outreaches that's gonna become our own? That's gonna speak to our city and get our city's attention and, and really demonstrate the love of God. And so somebody on our team came up with this idea of what if we had a Christmas market and took all the money and bought Christmas for kids? And we thought, that's crazy. You know, we're only eight weeks out. Sure, let's do it. You know, that's what faith looks like, right? And so we put together this Christmas market. Somehow, one way or another, word gets out, we have 52 vendors and we take the vendor fee and we put it into a pot to buy Christmas for these kids. And we, we got into contact with uh, the Boys and Girls Club of Limestone County and there's these kids who are in this program who may not otherwise get anything for Christmas. And so Cheyenne and I last week, we budgeted time and we said, okay, we're going shopping to Walmart. Well, six and a half hours later at Walmart, some of you men are like, welcome to hell because that's what it sounds like. <laughs> So, no joke, six and a half hours at Walmart, Christmas shopping, aisle to aisle. My iPhone told me I walked the aisles for three and a half miles almost. So, you get the picture, right? So, finally, uh, you know, we, we fill up the first cart, and on the first cart, it's filling up, and people are looking at us like, you guys are horrible parents. You spoil your kids. And so, no, 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 no. We're buying for 70 kids, not our two, 70 other kids. Well, by the time it was all said and done, we had filled up four cartloads. And I'm not talking like just fill up. I'm talking about overflowing. I've got to walk carefully because stuff's going to start falling out all over the place. Just toys and robots and Barbies and like all kinds of stuff. And we didn't go chintzy either. Like, if they said they wanted something, we found the best that we could buy and gave it to them. And um, so we've got our four carts, or as they say in Alabama, we had our four buggies, and they were overflowing, and we're trying not to spill toys all over the place. We, we finally get all the buggies to the register, and we're checking out, and, you know, people are taking note, and they're coming up, and they're asking questions, and this... You know, and at this point, six hours in Walmart will do things to your brain. Like, I was a little delirious. I had a slight tick, and, and, and so I'm up there, and we're just trying to get checked out, and, and this, this sweet lady comes over, and she's like, what's going on? And she, bless her heart, she's being nosy. Like, you know, she, she was like all in my business. So what's going on, and what's this for, and who are you with, and da 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 da, da. And I'm listening to her with one ear, and I'm trying to focus, you know, with the other, and... And, uh, 
And so, yeah, we're with Epic Church, and this is for 70 kids. And, you know, and I'm walking through her through all the details. And well, she just got so tickled. She said, can I give a donation? And I thought, oh, bless her heart. That's sweet. Yes, of course you can. Pulls out a $100 bill and gives us a $100 bill towards this project. <laughs> Guys, that's generosity. That's generosity being played out before your eyes. What's really cool is Cheyenne was separated with me the moment she gave it, but when she came back and I told her what had just happened, like literally there's times when you talk and it's like God talking through you and you don't realize it until after the fact. She said, you know what? We need to give that $100 to that director who gives so much of her time and her energy loving on those kids. So I was like, that's the Lord right there. Yes. And so that's what we're gonna do with that money. But God, like that's generosity. That's the heart of God because that's, that's who Jesus is. Jesus is a gift from God for us. But here's the danger in this. And, and, and there's two mindsets because sometimes there's a mindset that gets m- messed up because we have an American mindset, then we have a kingdom mindset. And, and I, I'm, a, I'm a proud patriot. I'm, I'm the son of, uh, of a, a, a politician. Like, I, I love my country, but kingdom always trumps country. And there's this mindset that we can get as Americans where we can lose and we can leak our passion for Christ because of the complacency that comes from our prosperity. You gotta realize, even if you're lower middle income in America, you're stinking rich and wealthy by standards of other people all over the world. We are the blessed of the blessed. We are the rich of the rich. Even if we can't go and buy a a, a $6 latte at Starbucks after service. And what happens is we can let our blessings and our abundance turn us into a critical consumer. And that's not kingdom thinking. That's not the heart of God. That's not the generosity that, that God used when he gave us Jesus. So don't let our blessings cause us to become complacent. Do you realize that right next to us is an eye storage facility? And I I point this out because sometimes it becomes about me. It becomes about I. And God doesn't want us to be people who are all about us. He wants us to be kingdom-minded. He wants us to be generous like he is generous. But how many times do we store our excess stuff because we have excess? Now, there's no shame in that. There's no fault in that. But how many times do we, we pay for storage that I'm gonna use that someday? We never use it. Come on, it ends up in a garage sale after we've stored it for two years and made monthly payments on it. The point is, is that we have so much and that God has given us so much but to whom much is given, there's gonna be more required. Therefore, we need to take on the attitude of Jesus and pour out into others. And you know what's crazy? If the world system really did work, America and Great Britain are the two most prosperous, technologically advanced nations in the world by far. Did you know what they're also number one and number two in? Unhappiness. That's the thing. Stuff and money is a great tool, but if you use it to replace God, it will never work. So we have to take on the attitude of Jesus. We have to be generous like God was. God gave, therefore we should too. Now, giving doesn't necessarily mean, well, pastor said give. I need to go out, find the 65-inch 4K TV and go buy one and give it away. Some of the greatest gifts that we can give are the intangibles. Come on. We can, we can love people who don't deserve love. We can show kindness when they're being ugly. We can forgive when they absolutely do not deserve it. We can give people encouraging words. We can offer them quality time. What is it that God has given you that you can give to somebody else? 
Think about it like this. You are like an Amazon distribution station walking through the earth that can just give it away and throw it this way and that way and you never run out. Because God will not be outgiven. That doesn't just apply to money. That applies to whatever seeds you sow. God is not mocked. Whatever you sow, whatever you give, that's what you're going to reap back. So don't think you'll ever pour out a kind words or you'll ever give too much forgiveness because God will just pour more back on you. You cannot outgive God. So what do we need to do? Here's what I see in scripture. Here's what I think we need to embrace. Here's what I think we need to pursue. In Matthew chapter two and verse 11, a scripture that you hear many times around Christmas, and I wanna read it to you. It says, and when they had come into the house, it's talking about the We Three Kings. You ever seen We Three Kings before? Of Orientar trying to smoke a rubber cigar? Anybody else ever seen that as a kid? Anyways, moving right along, my wife isn't here to, no, <laughs> no, stop that. And when they had come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother, and fell down and worshiped him. Golly, the first thing we should do is always lower ourselves, lift God up and worship him. Did you know that's the greatest gift that you can give God? God's given us everything. Golly, but he's got streets of gold. He owns all the real estate. The Bible says the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. If he ever wanted it, he could take it back in a moment. So what do we give the person who has everything? Have you ever tried to shop for like a grandparent? If they ever wanted it, they, they got the money to go out and get it. What do you get the person who's got everything? Give them your heart. You submit to his lordship. You say, God, everything that I have and everything that I am is yours because you gave it all to me. So here's these three wise men. Let's be wise men and wise women in Christmas present, in Christmas 2017. Let's learn some things from these wise men. And they opened their treasures and they presented to him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Now, you know, you look at this and you, you know this is a Christmas scripture because the only other time you, or the only other person who would know what frankincense was is if you were an essential oils distributor. So, Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. But what did they do? They gave the best that they have. Let's give God the best that we have. Let's give others the best that we have to give. Here's the point that I wanna make this morning. The truth is, it's not about the stuff. I don't have an issue with stuff. I'm fine with stuff. But it's not about the stuff. It's about Jesus and what he's did, done in us. So the byproduct of that is what we do for others. And the, here's the point that I want you to see. God's generosity towards us produced generosity in others. Because God gave first and because God gave best, the next thing that we see in scripture after God gives to humanity is humanity turns around and starts giving. Do you see that? Here's these wise men, and what do they do? Immediately they give. See, God's generosity towards us produced generosity in others. And God's gift is the greatest gift that we can have. Because when we get the gift of Jesus, we get everything that comes with Jesus. What do you mean by that? In other words, everything that Jesus is, his character his nature, his DNA, everything that Jesus is, we get when we receive him. So that means we get love because guess what? God is love. We get peace because the Bible calls Jesus the Prince of Peace. And you know what's so cool? It's Philippians chapter four and seven, seven says that it's a peace that surpasses all understanding. So it's a peace that comes from God that regardless of what your circumstances are, or regardless of what you're going through, regardless of what you're facing, regardless of what your bank account says, the Bible says that when you get Jesus, you get his peace. Yes. Amen. And it's a peace that's not gonna leave you. 
There's a difference. Sometimes we're after happiness. And you can buy something and be temporarily happy. You can go to a concert and be temporarily happy. But the problem with happiness is happiness is based off of circumstances. Happiness is based off of feelings. But what God wants to give us is joy. And joy doesn't matter what's happening around us. We can have joy despite. Despite this, despite that, despite the other, his joy sticks around. His peace sticks around. God gave so we can be generous. If you're lacking hope this morning, I want you to know that Romans chapter 15 and verse 13 calls God the God of hope. It's part of who he is. It's part of what he brings. Therefore, if you're feeling hopeless, Jesus has got the hope that you need. And the bonus is we get the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, mercy, and self-control. So when you know the character and nature of God, now you can begin to learn to act like God and be what a Christian is. You know what Christian means? It means a little Christ. Really, it means a little anointed one. In other words, you're anointed to act like God. You should act like your father. Like I know all of us grew up saying, I'm not gonna act like my dad. I'm not gonna act like my mom. And yet, you get older and it can be really good or really bad, but you're like, I'm turning into my parents. You know what? In the kingdom, you should turn in to your father. You should be a chip off the old block because he is God and we want to be like him on the earth. So let me read you another scripture that you hear typically around Christmas time. It's Isaiah chapter seven and verse 14. It says, all right then, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Look, the virgin will conceive a child. That's a sign, all right, that's a miracle. She will give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. Here's what I want you to see. The reason that this is significant, first of all, Isaiah The prophet lived 700 years before Jesus lived. So here he is prophesying and foretelling about Jesus long before he ever came. But here's why this is so significant. Because one of the names of God and every name of God in scripture is significant. But he's called Emmanuel. God with us. What does that mean? It it means you have access to God 24-7, 365. See, in the Old Testament, they didn't have access to God all the time. Every once in a while, a prophet would prophesy or a priest would do something cool or a miracle would happen, but they were few and far between. But now, Scripture is giving us a promise that no matter what is happening in our lives, no matter what day it is, God is with us and we have access to him. There's no more separation between God and man. No wonder Hebrews 4.16 says that we can come boldly to the throne of grace, that we might receive mercy and find help in time of need. That word boldly doesn't mean that you just burst into heaven God, I'm coming in here. No, it means confidently. We can come in confident into the king's quarters through prayer, knowing that we have access, knowing that God's not gonna say no, knowing that God's not gonna turn away, knowing that God is near and God is with us. So the greatest gift we can get this Christmas is not the hoverboard, not the PS4, not the keys to a new pickup truck. The greatest gift that we can get this Christmas is the present of his presence. See, we sing joy to the world, but sometimes we struggle with antidepressants. But if we'll get in his presence, it'll change our presence and it'll be a great present. There's a mouthful. Here's what, I, here's what I'm trying to say. Psalm 1611, you will show me the path of life in your presence is fullness of joy. And at your right hand are pleasures forevermore. 
I want to break this down for a second because it says in your presence. That literally means face to face. When we get close to God, when we get in God's face, you know what happens? Joy comes on us. You know what happens? The attributes of God come on us. Peace comes on us. And it's fullness of joy. That word fullness means abundance. It means overflowing. It means you're spilling all over the place. And so that joy is not just for you. That joy is meant to get on other people. Because other people need the joy of the Lord that's on and in you. A couple more scriptures and we'll wrap this thing up. Luke chapter 2 and verse 10. It says, but the angel reassured them, don't be afraid, he said. I bring you good news that will bring great joy to all people. Well, guess what? We're all people, right? All of us are people. Therefore, we qualify for the joy of the Lord. And I mentioned antidepressants just a moment ago. If you're on antidepressants, I don't say that for, to put any shame on you. What I'm saying is God wants to give you his joy today. And the joy of the Lord is better than anything that we can get in chemical form. Trust me, I know this. Luke chapter two and verse 10. Okay, we just read that one. Um, the point is this, God wants us full of joy this Christmas. God came to us so we could come back to him. That's the point. God came to us through Jesus because Jesus was the only way to fully get us back to him. It was the only way for us to have access to God fully again was through that gift. And I wanna say one more thing because there's, there's a contingent of people in the room. Maybe there's one, maybe there's 50. But here's what I know. Christmas time can be a hard time. Maybe it's because of the loss of a loved one. Maybe it's financial struggles. Maybe it's just hurt and shame and all those things that the enemy tries to pour on us. But what I wanna tell you and give you a promise of in this season is Psalm chapter 34 and verse 18. It says, the Lord is close to the brokenhearted. If you're brokenhearted today, if you're hurting today, know that God is near you. You might not have even known that, but God is near you and he saves those who are crushed in spirit. So if you're here today, and you're hurting today, and maybe the, the holidays, maybe Christmas is not a reminder of joy to you, but it's a reminder of pain to you, what I want you to know is that God is near. He's near you today. <laughs> and if you're lonely, we have some amazing small groups at this church. And I have no doubt that some of our awesome small group leaders will find a way to just bring you in and make you a part of the family so that you're not gonna be alone this Christmas. This is an incredible church filled with amazing people who absolutely have God's heart. So I want you to know that you're not alone. So let's embrace the gift of all gifts. Let's embrace Christmas present and let's change Christmas present this year. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this message today. I thank you for what you're speaking to people. God, I pray that we are going to embrace all that you are, Jesus, and all that you came to give us and to change in us. Lord, in the midst of everything we've committed to, in the midst of what feels like a lack of time and a lack of margin, God, I pray that we'll literally breathe a deep breath and remember what the point and what the purpose of Christmas truly is. And knowing from a place that we already possess the greatest gift that there is, which is you, Jesus, that we're gonna be able to breathe and we're gonna be able to have peace and we're gonna be able to have joy because we're gonna know that you're near us. 
So God, be with your people today. Love your people today. Encourage your people today. And let us become more and more like you. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. And the church said it loud and proud. Give the Lord a praise. Amen.